Let's say good morning, family. Our reading today is Isaiah 55, chapter 55, verse 1 through 5. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you, because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. And thank you, Michelle, for your courage and openness. I really appreciate that. And it really fits in with what I want to talk about this morning. And we have a society that is just obsessed with the whole concept of, of happiness. And as you contrast what the world thinks of happiness with what the Bible tells us, because the Bible speaks a lot about happiness as well, uh, there is a distinct difference. Uh, if we look at the Beatitudes, you know, that a section of the scripture that says, blessed are the so-and-so, for they will so-and-so, it, it Actually, that, that word blessed could be the word happy. Some translations have actually put that word in there. And that shows us that everyone in the world, whether you're Christian or not, we have this basic desire. We want to be happy. Now, different people define happiness in different ways, but it all boils down to the same basic human desire. We all want to be happy. You ever notice anyone says, oh, I wish I weren't happy all the time. <laughs> Nobody says that. There always seems to be something that is maybe lacking in our lives that we think if we were just able to attain, then we would be happier. Now, I'm going to give you all credit this morning and just start with a premise that you already know that happiness does not come from external things. It doesn't come from being successful or rich or good looking. It doesn't come from being married or single or whether or not you have a family or whether or not you have many friends. Happiness doesn't depend on material possessions or being able to do the things that everybody in the world thinks you need to be happy, to be able to travel or to have enough time and money to do whatever you want whenever you want. If you're under the notion that you cannot really be happy unless your life is a certain way, then see me later. Okay, we'll talk. We'll start from the ground level and we'll see what we can do about getting rid of that notion. But I'm sure most of you already realize that this elusive concept of happiness has to be derived from something beyond our outward circumstances. It has to come from within. Yet it is an intrinsic human desire to want it, to want to be happy. You know, we're built that way. We all want to be happy. I think maybe the first problem is that word, happy. I believe that because of our entertainment-oriented society, we've come up with an unrealistic concept of happiness. That's not even an accurate definition of the word. You know, people will ask, are you happy? As if that were some kind of level that you can actually reach at some point. Are, are you there yet? Have you reached happiness? From childhood fairy tales to romance novels to soap operas to plays and movies, we have redefined happiness to mean that life has no more problems for you and you have everything you want. And once you've attained this level and reached that point, then you can, what, live happily ever after because you've made it, you got there to that level. And many marriages crumble and many lives fall apart because of these unrealistic fantasies of what life is supposed to be like. Now, just the word happy brings those images to most of our minds. So I hesitate to even use it this morning. But it's a good word. I like the word happy. Just saying it makes you smile. You can't say the word happy without your mouth turning upward. I guess you could try if you really tried happy. But uh, you know, just naturally, just something that makes you smile. But the word content might be a, a more better word in more in line with biblical thinking. But that word seems kind of like a letdown, doesn't it? Are you happy? Oh, I'm content. You know, things could be worse. That's not what I'm talking about at all this morning. True contentment, true happiness, the kind that lasts through all of life's ups and downs, is something that just seems to elude most people. 
And if it eludes you, then I hope that we can gain some insights from this passage in Isaiah that will give you a handle on how to find a happiness that is not dependent on situations or circumstances or what other people say or do in your life. Simply put, happiness comes from experience the fullness of God in your life. Nothing else can bring the joy that a personal relationship with God can bring. And once you learn to base your happiness on your relationship with God, then nothing can take that away from you. So here are three things from Isaiah 55 that will hopefully help you get a handle on happiness. First of all, if you want to be happy, stop making excuses and start taking action. Most people who are unhappy can give you a list of reasons why they're not. How can I be happy when I'm so much in debt? How can I be happy when I have to work for my boss? I mean, you don't know him. You don't know what it's like. How can I be happy when I'm just so busy? I have so many obligations and responsibilities and so many commitments. I have to be here and I have to be there. How can I have time to be happy? How can I be happy when my spouse or my kids or my parents are so mean to me? And on and on the list goes. Well, the first step to finding happiness is to realize that whatever excuse that you've been giving yourself about why you're, no long, why you're not happy, that's no longer valid. Whatever problems you have, there are people out there with the same problems who are happy anyway. There are. There are people with cancer who are happy. There are divorced people who are happy. There are poor people who are happy and on and on. And you can be happy too, but you have to stop making excuses. Isaiah said in verse 1 of 55, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Isaiah is saying, stop making excuses. Whatever you think is holding you back isn't holding you back. God has eliminated all the barriers in your life to fulfillment and to peace and contentment. Even if you have no money, he says, don't use that as an excuse. Take action. Come anyway. Buy and eat. Don't let what you don't have hold you back from experiencing the fullness of God in your life. Stop making excuses and start taking action. Come to Christ. Reach out to Him. Turn to Him for your source of happiness. And if you do that, then He can fill you with a joy that you never imagined possible. The problem is that too often we spend all of our energy making excuses for our misery because of what we don't have, and those are the things that we don't really need anyway. In the fifth chapter of John, there's a story of a man who spent 38 years of his life lying beside the pool of Bethesda, hoping that he might be healed. And there was a belief that occasionally an angel would come to the pool and stir up the waters, and the first one into the pool when the water was stirred would be healed. And so Jesus approached this man and he said to him, Do you want to get well? Simple yes or no question. Do you want to get well? But instead of answering Jesus, the man made an excuse. He says, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. Jesus didn't ask him if he wanted to get into the pool. He asked him if he wanted to be healed. But the man wasn't really thinking anymore about being healed. He was just thinking of all the reasons why he couldn't get into the pool. And Jesus said, in effect, forget about the pool. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And the man was healed at that very moment. Many of you today might be sitting there beside some pool thinking, if I could just get in, if I could just have this thing, or if I could just do this thing, or if I could just be a certain way, then everything would be wonderful and life would be a dream. Jesus is saying, forget about the pool. It's not the pool that you need to be happy. It's me. Come to me. Stop making excuses and start taking action and come to me. Later in the book of John, in chapter 7, verse 37, Jesus said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. As, I, as Isaiah said, come to the water. Come to the source of life and happiness, which is a relationship with Jesus Christ. So becoming happy requires taking action on your part. You're not going to just wake up one day and realize that all the pieces of your life have fallen together and all your, your problems have gone away and now you're suddenly happy. You can't depend on your wife or your husband or your children or your parents or your employer to, to see to it that, that life is working out the way that uh, you want it to work. If you want to be happy, first of all, you have to stop making excuses and start taking action to find that happiness. Come to the waters, not please somebody help me come get into the pool. 
come to the waters. Secondly, if you want to be happy, you will have to eliminate some things in your life. Isaiah says in verse 2, Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? You know what I've noticed? That there are many people who want to be happy, and they're taking action to be happy. They're making that effort, but their strategy in finding happiness is to do things that can only make them miserable. It's like saying, I want to see the sunset, and I'm going to keep looking to the east until I see that sunset. I'm not going to give up. I'm just going to keep doing it. You're never going to see the sunset if you look only to the east, and you will never find happiness if you look for it in things that cannot give it. Yet, this is exactly what many people do day after day, year after year. This is exactly what Isaiah is referring to in verse 2. Many people live their lives just the way Isaiah described, spending money on that which is not bread and spending their labor on that which does not satisfy. There are two major ways that people do this. One is in destructive behavior. Some people fill their lives with self-destructive activities that are guaranteed just to bring misery. We can name them, you know, abusing alcohol, just spending too much money, being promiscuous, taking drugs, and on and on the list goes. And they do this thinking it's going to make them happy. Why else would anybody do those things if they think it's going to make them happy? But it doesn't, and it can't. It's spending money on what's not bread. It only leads to emptiness and, and isolation. And one of the most frustrating things about knowing someone who is caught up in a lifestyle of destructive behavior is that it's obvious to everybody but them that they're ruining their lives. Anorexia is a classic example of this. Now, to those who do not have this problem, it seems like the most ridiculous thing in the world. How can anyone so skinny be so worried about getting fat? But it's a different story when it's you or somebody that you love. I read of an anorexic who had dwindled down to 80 pounds. She had dark circles under her eyes and her skin was the color of paste. And she said, people keep telling me that I have a problem with food, but they don't understand that the only thing that makes me happy is my ability to not eat. Well, she didn't realize, even though it was obvious to everyone else around her, that she was looking for happiness in a way that would eventually kill her and could not give it to her. Alcoholics think that they need a drink to be happy, when the fact is, is that drinking ultimately makes them miserable. Some people go from affair to affair thinking that they need it. They need a man, they need a woman, somebody to make them happy. When the fact is that sex outside of marriage only leads to misery, sooner or later it only will lead you to misery. In order to get a handle on happiness, we need to learn to identify those things that we are doing that are destructive and to eliminate them from our lives. And I know it sounds easy, and it's not, especially when we're talking about addictive or compulsive behavior. It's a very complicated matter. And overcoming these things involves more than just you know, turning over a new leaf and saying, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. I know that's, that's not the case. If you are unhappy because you are caught up in some kind of addictive or compulsive behavior, you do need to know that God has the power to set you free from that. Your part in the process is to identify the destructive behavior and to recognize that it's ruining your life and then to do whatever you can do to eliminate it. There is help available to guide you through this process. There are support groups, there are rehab facilities and programs, there are medications, and I encourage the use of, of all those different things. But frankly, without the Lord, I don't know how you can even hope to do it. And you can never experience the fullness of God until you eliminate destructive behavior from your life. And God does have the power to help you do that. But you know what's just as bad as making yourself miserable with destructive behavior? It's making yourself miserable with futile behavior. There are certain things that we do that are not bad in and of themselves, but it is futile to expect them to make you happy. Probably most people who are unhappy fall into this category. For example, a career is a good thing, it's a necessary thing, we all need jobs, but no career can bring ultimate happiness. And yet, how many people pour their entire lives into a search for success and then discover that it just doesn't bring the happiness that they had hoped for? Now, being married is a good thing, it's a gift from God, but no earthly relationship can provide that inner peace and contentment that we all need. And how many people do you know that think, if I could just meet the right person, 
That would be great. I would have my fairy tale ending. Movie's over. Everything's good. Isn't everything always good after the movie's over? <gasps> Doesn't work that way. <sighs> or someone else who'd be thinking, if I could just get out of this bad relationship, then everything would be great. Or how many unhappily married couples do you know that think, if we just had a baby, maybe that would solve our marital problems and bring us the happiness that we're looking for. A job is good. A marriage is a blessing. Children are wonderful. But why look to these things to give you more than they can possibly give? Now, some of these things can certainly add to your happiness, but they cannot create your happiness for you. Isaiah says, why spend your money on what is not bread? That's kind of a symbolic thing for what is not substance, what's not real. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. He didn't mean he was actually bread. He meant that he was what life is all about. He's the substance of it. He's what we need. Why spend your labor on what does not satisfy? Why look for happiness in things that cannot make you happy? It is futile. The only way to find happiness is to experience the fullness of God through a personal relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ. If you're not happy right now, stop making excuses for your unhappiness and take action to get closer to God. And decide once and for all to eliminate everything from your life that's keeping you from Him and that relationship. And then thirdly, embrace your relationship with God. I don't know where each of you are spiritually right now. Maybe some of you are here today who have never really taken any action to get to know God through Christ. Maybe your religion consists of just attending church on Sunday and, and that's it. But I want you to know that there's so much more to having a relationship with God than, than what we do here on Sunday mornings. Living the Christian life is about more than just you know, doing good deeds for God, which hopefully we do as Christians. But more, it's about having that spiritual connection with God that it lasts 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I mean, literally, you know, you, you sleep differently when you're close to the Lord. If you know that, you know what I'm talking about. It really makes a difference in every hour of every day. George Gallup conducted a survey that concluded that fewer than 10% of Americans are deeply committed Christians. But the people who make up this group, according to Gallup, can be categorized as particularly influential and happy. He called them a breed apart. He said that they're more tolerant to people of diverse backgrounds. They're more involved in charitable activities. They are more involved in practical Christianity. They are absolutely committed to prayer. And he said that they are far, far happier than the rest of the population. Now, we all know of professing Christians who don't fit in that category. They're just plain grumpy, who are always mad about something. There's an old joke about a guy who went to heaven and as St. Peter led him through the pearly gates, the first thing that he saw was a complaint box. And he said, well, if everyone's so happy in heaven, why is there a complaint box? And St. Peter said, well, we learned a long time ago that the only way some people can be happy is if they have something to complain about. <laughs> We've all known some people like that. But don't mistake what they have for the kind of happiness that God offers to you. God offers happiness that is so deep and so dynamic that the Apostle Peter referred to it as a glorious and inexpressible joy. Joy beyond words. That's what God wants for each one of us to have. And through Isaiah, he said in the second part of verse 2, Listen, listen to me and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. God's saying, you don't have to look any further. You don't need anyone else. You don't need anything else. All you need is Him. And Isaiah brings the word of the Lord as, as pleading for His people to come to Him. As verse 3 says, Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. That's not just talking about, oh, you get to go to heaven one day after you die. It's talking about entering into a covenant with the Lord who, who changes the way that you live and you think. And then in the second part of verse 3, he offers David as an example of this. It says, I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations that you do not know will hasten to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Now this is a specific promise to Israel, given to them, that their nation would be restored back to the way it was in the days of David, even though it would be conquered and it, they, the people would be sent into exile, but he would again endow them with splendor. They would uh, once again summon nations rather than being kicked out of their own household. And that promise is for us as well. 
we may not be concerned with conquering nations, but we have been made more than conquerors, the book of Romans tells us. We have victory over sin and death, which otherwise had and would have defeated us. We share in the riches of God's kingdom. So come to Christ and your soul will live. He's saying that he can give you happiness above and beyond anything that this world has to offer. God wants to fill your life with good things. He wants you to live and not just survive. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And he means that. So embrace your relationship with God. Follow Jesus. Talk to him. Listen to what he says to you through his word. And put your hope for happiness in nothing else but him. And he'll give you a happiness that is beyond words. It's not the kind of happiness that you hear about in fairy tales or, or soap operas, you know, because that's not even real. But the only way to get a handle on happiness is to experience the fullness of God in your life through a personal relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. That is what is real. If you are unhappy right now, stop making excuses for being unhappy and start taking action to experience the joy that God wants for you and has in store for you. Ask him to help you eliminate those things in your life that are keeping you from experiencing his fullness. Things that are perhaps destructive or futile. And simply embrace your relationship with God. Cling to God as if he were your only hope for happiness. Because he is.